Well, thanks for coming out on a Tuesday evening here. And uh, you know, I've done a couple of these seminars in the past, and I've made longer talks and things. But it seems like you know we'll touch on some superficial things, maybe <laughs> a couple of I injuries that folks may have. And uh, then I really want to make it you know more interactive. Uh, you know, you all obviously come because you have some uh, foot and ankle dilemmas or questions, and uh, I'd be happy to spend some time afterwards. We have the whiteboard. I can draw some pictures of what the ankle is, what the foot is, what the joints are, and try to go through some of the common problems if you have questions about problems. But one thing I really kind of wanted to talk about tonight was uh, the myths that are out there in foot and ankle surgery. And nobody can open up a, uh, the morning call without seeing five or six advertisements in there, all proclaiming the, you know, the cure to every foot ailment there is. And uh, I, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I uh, based my practice on science and reality and things that, that have been proven to work. I'm not experimental, not meaning that I'm not young and I, I do try to do cutting edge things, but uh, we're a community here. We're not a uh, university hospital where it's the end game and you're here to have the, uh, you know, try out, see if this might work for you. I, I'm much more based my practice on, on proven guidelines and things that really work uh, and have proven to work and not out here to practice on people that I live with and, and see it giant. So um, we can start going. I'll just go through some of my, uh, my talk here first and we'll take it from there. So first of all, who am I? I am an orthopedic surgeon um, and I specialize in foot and ankle surgery. I also have uh, an interest in trauma. I also do some sports medicine surgery uh, and you know play uh, dabble in other parts, but my real niche specialty is, is foot and ankle surgery. Uh, I've been in the area for the past 12 years or so. Um, mostly I've practiced on the eastern side of the valley, Bethlehem, Easton, Phillipsburg, but I have see patients from anywhere up, you know, in northeastern PA here in, in Jersey as well. Uh, I'm board certified in orthopedic surgery. I do live locally, like I mentioned, so I try to treat my patients uh, like friends and neighbors. Uh, I did play college football, so I've suffered most orthopedic injuries there are out there, so I have a pretty good perspective on the, uh, the athlete's point of view as well. So just a quick review of what an orthopedic surgeon is. Um, we're a little, you know, we have some specialized training compared to other uh, foot and ankle practitioners. I did go to four years of college, four years of med school, five years of a residency in, in general orthopedic surgery. I did a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery and trauma surgery down at Vanderbilt University, so essentially Graduate from 26th grade before getting my first job. Okay, so first myth. High-heeled shoes cause bunions. Um, myth, okay. Bunions are inherited. The best way to tell, uh, whenever I see somebody that has a bunion, one of the first questions is, what did your mom's feet look like, your dad's feet, your grandparents' feet? They don't come from wearing shoes, unless, of course, you lived in ancient China and bound your feet from the day you were born until you're 20, and then of course you're gonna have some de foot deformities. Now a point that you is however make bunions symptomatic. So if you ever put a pair of those fancy high-heeled shoes on the ground and put your foot next to it, they don't match. And because they don't match, if you have a bunion, it can become more symptomatic just from kind of getting squeezed within the uh, shoe itself. So this is what I was saying, look at some of those pointy shoes and that Nice round foot just doesn't fit in those shoes. Now, this is a, a kind of a neat x-ray. This is an x-ray of somebody actually in a high-heeled shoe. And I think you can tell. Here's my pointer. This is where a bunion occurs on this side of your foot. And you see that's exactly where this whole shoe is really getting squeezed. So bunions don't come from high heels, but certainly become more symptomatic. Second myth. Ankle sprains are worse than a broken bone. 
So just a quick review. What's, what is a sprain? Everybody said, thinks they know what a sprain is, but in general, a sprain occurs usually when your ankle inverts. And what that usually means is stepping off of a curb or on a rock or get tripped, your heel turns in, your body weight turns out, and you put all that stress on the outside of your ankle. That's the most common sprain. That's what we call an inversion injury. Ligaments, quick anatomy lesson again, I can draw pictures later, but a ligament is, is a rope. It connects a bone to a bone. So we have ligaments all over, in the knee, the ankle, the foot. So the big ligaments in your knee, or in your ankle, I'm sorry, connect your, your heel bone to your ankle bone, and your ankle bone to your leg bone. So when those, when that, what ankle rolls, the talus bone, which is the all ankle bone, stretches those ligaments on the outside. Ligaments don't rip in half. You hear somebody says they have torn ligaments. In the ankle, ligaments don't really tear in half. They stretch out more frequently. So think of a, like a glad bag or a plastic bag stretching. It doesn't always snap back like a rubber band. Sometimes they stay stretched out. And those are the people that, that occasionally have some issues, long-term issues with ankle sprains. Grading sprains. Here's a busy slide. Um, but a lot of times people who have a sprain will go to their to the ER, the orthopedic surgeon, the podiatrist, and they'll be told they have a grade one sprain or a grade two sprain or a grade three sprain. In general, I, I think of it more of a, a kind of a, a spectrum. People sometimes like to have a label put onto their uh, diagnosis. So if you think about it, grade ones are not so bad. Grade threes are really bad. Um, so the grade ones are when you step on that rock, your ankle twists, you feel okay, you get up and walk on it the next day or two, you're fine. While grade threes are the really high energy injuries Soccer player stepping on a ball full force and really turns the ankle. In that case, all the ligaments about the ankle are, are stretched out, the ones on the outside, sometimes the one on the inside, and those more severe sprains have the higher risk of being chronic or long-term problems. So here's a picture, here's my pointer here. So we're looking at the ankle from the side. This little guy is the fibula, that's that outside bone or the knuckle you can feel on the outside of your ankle. Your heel bone is your calcaneus. And then this bone hidden right here is called your talus. So this is the complicated ankle ligaments on the outside of your ankle. And you can see there's lots of different ligaments. There's ones that connect the fibula to the tibia up here. This is the, the, the old high ankle sprain occurs up a little bit higher. This ligament here and this ligament here are the, usually the ones that get injured uh, in your standard sprains. So how do you treat an ankle sprain? I don't know if anybody knows the, the mnemonic RICE, R-I-C-E, stands for rest ice compression and elevation. So in general, rest, pretty obvious, take it easy. Ice, ice in general, almost across the board in orthopedic surgery injuries, ice better than heat. Heat sometimes works for long-term muscle pain, but in general, we always recommend ice. It's a, it's a natural anti-inflammatory, it's a natural analgesic, makes things feel better. Compression, that's sometimes an ace bandage. Don't, don't Tie it on too tight. It's not supposed to be a real tight thing, but just something to kind of keep the, keep the swelling down. And elevating it, which is probably the most important of all those three. Prop it up in the air. Get the swelling down. Bracing is something we use a lot. I use a lot in my practice. Um, the old adage about getting your ankle taped when you played basketball or football or soccer or cheerleading. Uh, it's, tape stretches out in about 15 minutes. So although the kids love to do it and love to get online to get their ankles taped, I'm not a huge fan. Bracing really works better. If the brace stretches out, you can always cinch it up a little tighter. And this goes for the weekend athletes as well. I use a lot of braces in the office. Probably the key to getting folks better from ankle sprains is therapy. Uh, and therapy is for a couple of things. It's for retraining the muscles, get it stronger again. Retraining the nerves to get your balance back. So when you do hit that pebble or rock, your nerves are, are functioning again so your ankle doesn't twist again. Um, most ankle sprains do great. 85% of severe ankle sprains do very well with conservative management. Surgery is rarely indicated in an ankle sprain. In my hands, I, can't, I would say just about nobody needs surgery on an ankle sprain for the first three months unless the ankle is just so unstable from some sort of huge car wreck. But in general, most people will get better through physical therapy. <clears throat> so ankle fractures, to answer this question, is a break worse than a, a sprain. So ankle fractures is, is very, very variable. Um, anywhere from a, a simple little chip fracture to a, a major injury. Uh, bones in general do heal very well. Um, sometimes it requires surgery to line up those bones if they're out of place or distracted from where they normally uh, are supposed to be. But in general, bones heal. 
Uh, which bones are fractured clearly is important in, uh, in, in the severity of the, of the injury. Is it a stable fracture? And what that means is when you broke that bone, did it stay generally where it belongs? And by stable, when we talk foot and ankle surgery, it usually means can I walk on it right away? And certainly there are plenty of fractures that we see that put you in a boot or a cast and you can walk on it right away because it's stable. We don't need to add stability. Adding stability comes from my end if I have to put plates or screws or rods or whatever we need to do to fix things. And of course, does it involve the joint? That's a pretty key, key element. Whenever you have a fracture that involves the joint, the complexity level goes way up because now you're worried about arthritis and problems in the joint itself rather than a fracture that doesn't involve the joint. So, you know, here's, a, here's an x-ray young kid. These are growth plates. So we always see lots of young little guys that come in with injuries. And there's a tiny, tiny little chip fracture at the end of the bone there. So if you ask me, is that a bad fracture? I'd say, you know, not, not too bad. And a sprain could be worse than that fracture. While we compare to this guy who had a big fracture all the way up and down the leg here and required all kinds of plates and screws. And you can see stitches from almost the ankle all the way up to the knee to fix this thing. So in that case, I'm going to say, yeah, maybe a, a sprain is, is better than, than the break. So generally, most sprains are treated conservatively and don't require any surgery. The majority of fractures on the same uh, line of thinking heal very well and only rarely require surgery. In general, I'm going to have to say a sprain is probably better than a break. If you guys want me to stop anywhere along the way with questions, feel free. Like I said, I'm just going to kind of fly through <clears throat> these questions and then answer anything at the end, too. Um, heel pain. This is, a, this is the most common complaint that comes into our office is heel pain. Um, and the question always is, I have heel pain, I must have a spur. It's very easy to say you have a spur. It's easy for the ER doctor, it's easy for your family doctor, it's easy for some podiatrist and orthopedic surgeon to say you have a spur. In general, the spur has nothing to do with your heel pain. Heel pain has a lot of causes. The most common is this long word up here, and I'm sure if anybody's had heel pain, they've heard this word. It's called plantar fasciitis. <coughs> Excuse me. Most common problem we see. This is the classic. I wake up in the morning. I can't walk. I can't put my heel to the ground. It hurts like crazy. I'll take 10 or 15 steps. Feels great. Walk around all day. Sit down for breakfast. Take a break. Get up and my heel hurts again, and then I gotta walk it off again, and it, gets, and it gets better after a few steps. That's in compared to Achilles tendonitis, and we'll get back into this other problem too. Achilles tendonitis is that pain in the back of your heel, not where you're walking, but in the back, where your Achilles tendon, which everybody knows where it is, is the big thick tendon behind your heel bone that inserts onto the back of your calcaneus. That pain is usually different. That is not usually so bad in the morning. That usually gets worse with activities, so the more you exercise or runners classically get Achilles tendonitis. Bursitis, a bursa, they occur any, a lot of places in your body, shoulders, elbows, knees, hips. Also, you can have them on, on your heel. And a bursa is, is a fluid-filled sac, sort of sits between your skin and a bone, and the whole concept is to decrease friction. So when your skin moves, it doesn't rub right on the bone. So we actually do have a bursa right on the heel bone itself. That's a little bit more rare problem. But that's somebody who, every time they just touch their heel to the ground, has, has some pain. Stress fractures can occur anywhere in the foot and ankle. Very, very common place to get stress fractures. And again, I'll get into that in a few seconds. So plantar fasciitis, like I was, I was just getting into, it's not caused by the spur. But this is the reason most people come in is this plantar fasciitis. It's actually caused by very small tears of this banded tissue called the plantar fascia. The plantar fascia is this thick lining. It's not a muscle, it's not really a ligament. It's this thick band of tissue that goes from your heel and it kind of splays all the way out to your toes. It helps to give you an arch. It helps to give you this sort of spring mechanism on the bottom of your foot. And it's very common to get these little microscopic tears in that plantar fascia, right where that heel bone, right where it originates off the heel bone. Classically, people are worse in the morning or when sitting for a period of time. Most of the time, we don't know what the cause of it is. Sometimes it's an overuse injury. Some people can actually remember, I joined curves and I, I walked for you know, three miles the first day I showed up. Some people gain weight. Some people take up a new activity. But in general, most of the time, we don't really know the actual cause of it. Treating 
almost always it gets better with simple stretching exercises. And that's something we can talk about because I'm sure a lot of people have plantar fasciitis. There's one stretch that I use all the time, but in general we're trying to stretch out your heel cord and the bottom of your foot. And if you get it to stretch out, it heals in a stretched out position. If it heals in a stretched out position, it doesn't hurt anymore. Rarely, and we just had a, had a meeting this past weekend with about six uh, foot and ankle specialists, and in general, nobody said anywhere over 10% of people need surgery. So well under 10%, in my hands, I'm thinking probably more 5% of people ever need surgery for this kind of problem. Almost always we get it better with either stretching or orthotics or physical therapy or a combination of all those things. Achilles tendonitis, like I was saying, this is the pain directly at the back of your heel where that Achilles tendon inserts onto the back of the heel. This thing can be related to an injury, can be from an overuse injury as well, or it can just be unknown. Some people actually have a large calcification on the back of the heel, and this is where, I, if I say spur, I, I, we can call it a spur, we can call it a calcification, whatever, but it's when there's a growth of, of a bone coming from the back of the heel that can actually dig into that Achilles tendon. And I'm going to show you a picture of that in a sec. Um, that spur digging into the Achilles tendon can cause these little microscopic tears. Let me see if I have. Yeah, we'll get into it some more. Um, treatment for this is, again, most things in orthopedics, foot and ankle surgery stuff, is non opera So we always try the simpler stuff, stretching and physical therapy, bracing, casts. And I put this in big capitals because this is my public service announcement for the night. Don't allow anybody, no matter who they are, who, how well you know them, or how many years you've seen them, to give you injections around that Achilles tendon. I, I, it's, a, it's a major tendon. It's inflamed and angry. And although steroids sometimes makes things feel better, I think for the one person where, that, where it, it, it decreases the strength that that Achilles can rupture, that's a disaster. And that's a disaster we can solve by not ever doing it. I'm not saying it happens to everybody that has tendonitis that gets an Achilles, that gets an injection there, but I've seen two or three of them in the last six years, and it's a, it's a preventable problem because if your Achilles ruptures, that's a big ordeal, and that's something we don't even want to get into. So that's my public service announcement. Uh, surgery for this does occur, and I think it's more common to have surgery for this problem than for plantar fasciitis, and that's because as I'll show you in a picture here, there's a big spur that can occur back there, and a lot of times, if that isn't cleaned out, it's hard to get the Achilles tendon to heal. So, to answer the myth, you can have heel pain without a spur. You can have a spur without heel pain, and only for certain conditions does the spur actually need to be removed. Now, I don't, this picture here it doesn't project so well, but this is your heel here, and back here is where you can get that heel spur. The Achilles tendon comes down from here and digs in right on this spot. So the back of your heel is where Achilles tendonitis occurs, while the bottom of your heel down here is where plantar fasciitis can occur. This one, and this, this is a post-operative x-ray, and you guys may have a better view of it than me, but I've taken off that big spur in the back of the heel over here. The Achilles tendon is then reinserted onto the bone to, uh, to, to, to connect everything back up again. Fourth myth, and I think I, I think I have maybe five myths to go through. Foot and ankle surgery hurts more than any other surgery. Uh, and this is, this is a big fear for folks that come in to see us, that everybody says nothing hurts more than having your, op, your foot or your ankle operated on. Well, that's obviously a big concern to us because we want to do things to make you feel better, and we're not, you know, not the dentist. We're not out to try to make you hurt. Um, so there's many techniques we use to prevent post-operative pain. Uh, anatomical blocks, and anybody that's probably had uh, shoulder surgery may have had some uh, block done, or total knee patients, we do a lot of this now, but there's specific blocks where before you even get into the operating room, will numb up your leg, kind of tricking your body so they don't, you know, your body doesn't realize something actually happened to it. So it's called preemptive analgesia, where we try to get there before the surgery ever happens and numb things up. That really does help very well to knock down those endorphins and everything else that can cause that flare-up of pain. After surgery, we mix different kinds of narcotics that everybody knows, the codeines and the Vicodins and the Percocets. Sure, that, that helps, but I think a big part of that is also using anti-inflammatories like Motrin or Ibuprofen or fancy Celebrex or any of those kind of medications that also decreases the inflammation. So we try to attack the, uh, the um, pain from different directions. Uh, well, I guess that's it. That's my fourth myth. Um, so I talked straight through for 20, 
two minutes there. Um, and I kind of touched on a bunch of topics, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you guys about any other things, but I could also mention some other myths that are out there that I'd have, uh, you know, there's, if, if we run out of questions, then we can go through things, too. Sure. You said you were going to bring up stress fractures. Yes, okay. I thought it was in this chart, too, but let me talk about stress fractures. A stress fracture is, is exactly that. I, I describe it, it happens in two people. Somebody with normal bone, but an abnormal activity, or somebody with abnormal bone and normal activities. So n normal bone, think of the soldier, guy just joins the army, big, strong, 18-year-old kid. First day he shows up, he hikes for 50 miles. Well, that's overstressing a normal bone. The abnormal uh, bone with normal stress, we're not talking cancer, but a lot of folks have osteoporosis or osteopenia where you just don't have the calcium in the bone. And normal activities on a bone that doesn't have the calcium or the density to it can cause a stress fracture. Now, what's a stress fracture? Paper clip. Think of a paper clip. You bend it, bend it, bend it, bend it, bend it, it gets hot. Then it gets those little cracks in it. And that's the point that it's a stress fracture. If you keep bending it and bending it, bending it, it might actually completely break through it. Um, a lot of stress fractures don't show up on x-rays. So somebody will come to the office, they hurt directly on a specific bone, x-rays are normal. That's when, it come, that's when the, you know, the diagnostic stuff comes in. And my usual test that I go to to, to prove it is an MRI. Uh, MRIs are very sensitive at picking up fractures. Other tests you can have are, are bone scans. A bone scan involves getting an injection with a needle, and then three hours later they scan you. So MRI is a little quicker, a little simpler, no needles, and that's usually the direction we go. Anybody else? Yeah. I do have osteoporosis, and I'm finishing up two years for payoff. Uh huh. But a month ago, we were babysitting our grandchildren. I was on my feet all day, every day, and my feet are flat. Mm -hmm. My left foot goes in, bone goes out. By the end of the week, and I've been putting off calling my doctor. I'm hoping it's <laughs> sort of getting better. Mm -hmm. I know it probably should go in, but it swelled up. My foot swelled up. And mm -hmm. I do a lot of walking, and I haven't been able to walk. I just started yesterday. Okay. A sprain? Well, no, well, I, I, I mean, it's a good topic you brought up because that's probably the second or third most common thing is, is flat foot. Okay, now, flat foot, there's, think of it as two different types, okay? You have flat foot as a kid, okay? Benign flat foot that you inherited, and most of the time it goes away. Look at your kids, your grandkids, all five-year-olds are flat footed. But if you go up on their tiptoes, their arch comes back. And that's just because they're sort of loose, loose jointed. Now there's some of those people, and it's a small percentage of the people that were flat footed, that stay flat footed their whole lives. Um, those folks are probably at a biomechanical disadvantage for getting stress fractures and things like that. But in general, we don't really worry too much about the people that are what we call a flexible flat foot, which are usually the, the kids. The problems, and this might be more you, are people that were normal, had a normal arch, and all of a sudden, my arch collapsed. Now my one foot is much flatter than my other one used to be, and I'm having some pain. So that's more of an acquired flat foot, meaning you weren't born with it, you developed it somehow. Wow. And the, sorry, always you always had them. All right, well let me finish my thought about the acquired one, just to cover it, because that's a pretty big topic. The, the acquired flat foot means one was normal, or a little flatter, and then all of a sudden one turns in and you almost have that suction cup feeling as you're walking in the bathroom, like your arch is all of a sudden hitting the ground that it didn't used to do. That is usually caused not from an injury, but from another tendon. And remember, tendons are, are they go from a muscle to a tendon to a bone, so they move. They're not like ligaments that are, that are ropes. They, go, they glide, so it's like your Achilles tendon. And what can happen is that tendon is called your posterior tibial tendon, second biggest tendon in the ankle, runs right behind that knuckle on the inside. That tendon tears, stretches and unravels, and as that thing stretches out, all of a sudden that arch begins to collapse in. So that's something that it could be. Um, and that's a real common problem we'll see in the office. Once that happens, you know, we try to again treat you symptomatically to decrease the inflammation along that tendon. It hurts when it rips. Some people, the pain kind of settles down and they just accept that one foot turns in. 
Other people still have pain with that kind of problem, and there's a whole process that we go through to try to recreate the arch, either through orthotics, which sort of work, or braces above the ankle, or even surgery sometimes. Uh, I've never, I mean, it's always been this way. I've never had a problem until this last month. Well, Part of it, I think I wore too flat of a shoe around the household. Well, somebody like you that, that tells me, I am osteoporotic, I'm on Forteo, I did a lot of work last week taking my grandkid, now I have real bad pain. That's, that's the description of a stress fracture a lot of times. So, you know, that would require some, you know, kind of pushing on you, feeling where you're hurt, and maybe doing the MRI scan. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead. Um, I have, that's the reason why we're here is because I do have foot pain. Okay. It was very active at one point. About two years ago, I was diagnosed with a neuroma mm -hmm. in my right foot. And I also have bunions. Too. Yep. These are all good things because these are all real common problems. It's good to, <laughs> to ask the questions. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, they're good, they're good to talk about too. Oh, yeah. And then last year, probably Valentine's Day, I was walking. I had skied. Uh -huh. I was a skier. On a Friday and then on a Saturday, we went to a concert. And as I was walking, I couldn't walk anymore. Uh -huh. And um, they said it was a stress fracture in the same area where the neuroma is. Yeah, yeah. Now, a year has passed. The neuroma is still there. Yeah. I think the stress fracture in its own way has healed yeah. in some instances. But now, two toes, I can't. They don't, they don't do anything for me anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't bend them really. Okay. I can't even split them. Really? Um, well, we, you, hit, you hit like three big topics there. Neuroma, bunion, and... Uh, and toe problems, um, and they're all these are all good. These are all you know top ten foot and ankle problems. So uh, I'm going to draw some pictures of a bunion because that's the best way for me to describe I that. Show you a bad one. Well, we can show it. I'm sure you can, and we all want to see it. I'm sure. <laughs> but we're gonna, I'm going to I'm going to teach you about bunions in a sec. Neuroma, though. Let me hit you with, with an, what a neuroma is for folks that don't know what a neuroma is. A neuroma is, is, is a nerve, okay? And neuromas can occur anywhere in the body as well, but in general they occur from a, either, uh, uh, it's, a, it's scar tissue that's formed around a nerve, okay? And that scar tissue that forms around a nerve sometimes gets so thick that the nerve itself just becomes dysfunctional, okay? We can get neuromas uh, in, in the foot and ankle, there are two places you get a neuroma. You either get one from having surgery and you got scar tissue around a nerve, or you get one, sound, kind of sounds like what you're describing. Can, some people call it a Morton's neuroma, which is the name of uh, you know, Dr. Morton sometime who, who described it. But essentially, between your toes where these nerves divide, right at the ball of your foot here is a very common place where just from pounding, 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 that nerve starts to get scar tissue around it. Um, and what can you do about it? Well, you can do simple stuff. Ice it, medicines, all these things we talked about. A little bit more invasive step is doing a cortisone injection. No, yeah, so cortisone is an, an anti-inflammatory. It just makes things feel better. And it's good to, to diagnose it, but also to sort of help it. And if that doesn't work, neuromas in the front of your foot between your toes, that's the one spot where you can actually remove a nerve. I mean, there's nobody else in your body where you're just going to remove nerves because that means you're all of a sudden going to be numb or not functioning. But in the very end of your foot, that's usually what we do. Go down, find the nerve, remove it, throw it out, uh, and you might end up with a little bit of numbness between the two toes. I have that now. Yeah, and, and most people don't even notice that, but the pain does get, get better. I mean, every surgery has smaller risks, but a neuroma surgery is usually pretty, as long as, you, as long as you're sure it is a neuroma, and that's not you sure, that's us being sure, that usually it gets better from a pretty simple surgery. If you've had it for two years, it might be worth checking it out. Yeah. yeah she even got that pad. Same concept. The psychiatrist, and he gave the pad. Right. Yeah. Underneath. Right. You put the pad, just the way to do it is, yeah, or the right, you know, take them. For anybody that uses pads at home, a good trick, take some lipstick, put lipstick right where your foot hurts, step in your shoe, and then wherever that red mark shows up in the shoe, you put the pad a little closer in. You don't put the pad right where it hurts, or else that causes pain worse than before. So, quick anatomy lesson for everybody. Your metatarsals, those are the bones, and I'm gonna point to my hand because I don't have a model, before your, before your toes, okay? Right before the toes, we all have five metatarsals. They look like this. Four, Five. And then your toe comes out this way, okay? So 
That's essentially a quick cartoon of what your, what your foot looks like. Big toe, is, Big toe is over here, right? There's really strong ligaments between your second and third, your third and fourth, and your fourth and fifth. There's not a ligament between your second metatarsal and your first. So what happens, and I'll just move over a step here, this metatarsal can drift over to the side. And like we talked about, that's usually probably genetic, but it has a, more factors to it than we can just say, this gene causes bunions. So imagine that metatarsal now drifts over that way. Well, these guys are still held close together by these tight ligaments in here. So now, if I were to draw this in two dimensions and kind of make this sort of look like a bone here, right, and make these little guys look like bones here, and then your toe bone is over here, so that's your toe bone, and then these toes stay over here. Now if I put in some ligaments in through here, these ligaments are in here, so those ligaments and those are still there, and then if I draw some skin over like that, and some fat and stuff, now you kind of get the idea of why that side of your foot is all of a sudden sticking out like a bunion. And I think the word bunion, believe it or not, means, uh, I'm blanking on it, a turnip. Bunion means turnip in some Greek or something. But basically everybody thinks that the bunion, like you just said, over here somebody said it, is get it cut off. Well, if all you do surgically is remove this little bump over here that's sticking out, and maybe make that thinner, you haven't really cured the problem. The problem is that this bone is sticking over that way. So now we're into you know, high school physics stuff. You have an angle right here, this angle, that's too wide. And you need to make this angle more narrow. And what that comes down to, you know, deciding how, how bad this angle is, and that gets kind of technical and on an individual basis, but this big angle we have to make more parallel. So somehow we have to bring that bone over this way where it belongs again. Plus, you do shave off the bump, but by doing that, you straighten the whole front of your foot out again. Could you break that bump? Could you had to say break, because now nobody's going to come in, but yeah. <laughs> we like osteotomize. It's a fancier name for breaking. <laughs> but yeah, we break the bone. And you can either break it here for simple bunions, and I'll, I guess we'll talk about it a little bit. So if it's just a mild bunion, and I'm not even going to throw numbers at you, but if it's mild, you can break the bone there and move this over a little bit and correct it. If it's a more severe bunion, you have to break it down here. Um, and that's just physics, you know, vectors and angles and things. So you get more correction if you do a bigger surgery. What are the chances of success? Here's what, you know, I think in bunions, there, it's, it's, it's a tough problem. And everybody thinks this is a very simple problem, but of all those, that picture I showed you with big fractures and plates and screws, that's actually easier sometimes than bunions, right? Because bunions, we're, we're fighting Mother Nature. Mother Nature wanted you to be this way, and now we're trying to fight it and bring it back straight. So right off the bat, it's, it's, it's not a straightforward procedure. But I think the biggest problem in bunions is that if you try to cheat and you try to do a simple surgery when you need a really big surgery. So to answer your question, I think if you do the correct surgery for it, it's good surgery. People do well. The foot straightens out. The, um, the biomechanics of your foot are, are, are recreated again, so people do well. What I will say, and I think this probably goes back to the myths of all this, a huge myth is that there is no such thing as cosmetic foot and ankle surgery. Okay, no such thing as a cosmetic bunion surgery. You don't, if you come to me and say, I just don't like the way my foot looks, I got this bump. My answer is, live with the bump. Because the only reason to do bunion surgery is if you're having pain. And there are people, there's plenty of people that have pain because they can hurt. You know, they can hurt because this rubs. It can hurt because this joint isn't lined up like it's supposed to be lined up. Don't step on a rock. <laughs> so, I mean, there are certainly people that have huge bunions where their big toe is on top of their third toe. They have no pain, I'm perfectly happy. You can wear a wide shoe. So there are complications and problems and it's a long recovery and it's a whole ordeal. So there's reasons to do surgery, and, and pain is the number one reason. Cosmesis, or looking like your foot straighter, is not an answer. But you can't wear shoes. You can buy a wider shoe. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, I mean, there's a, there's a point where you, you know, people are bad and think you need it. Yeah. What's the recoup time on that? On a bunion? Let's just say in general. All right, bad bunion, where we're actually doing a bigger, a bigger surgery down at the bottom. Bones take six weeks to heal. 
So we're breaking the bone, we're osteotomizing the bone. It takes six weeks for the bone to heal. But it depends on how, you know, how confident I am in, in the fixation, which means the screws that are holding things together. So in general, I'll, uh, just a gross overview, and it really you have to individualize everyone. At least a week you don't walk on it, just to let skin heal. Then it's in some sort of protective device, whether it's a cast or a boot, or a you know, cast or a boot, and probably let you walk on the back of your heel for the first next four or five weeks. This takes six weeks to heal. There's no, you can't make that heal any faster. So if you try to walk on a broken bone too soon, it falls apart. So in general, let's say six weeks for everything to heal, but anywhere up to six months for all the swelling to go down. So you know, although we would like to get you in shoes as soon as we can, sometimes the swelling prohibits that from happening. So I will tell most people, typically three months beginning to when I discharge it. Chances of reoccurrence? If you do the right surgery, it shouldn't be too high of a recurrence. Okay. Do you do pretty many of them? Yeah. I have another question. How about her back there? Yeah. <laughs> Could we back up to the problem of flat feet? Yeah, sure. I have one. Am I better over here? I you have, have one flat foot? Flat foot. Okay. Right. I have orthotics. Mm -hmm. um, I have a Richie brace, which I wear sometimes. You mentioned surgery. Could you tell me what's involved with that? Okay. Um, so to, to cover everything that she just mentioned, so everybody's on the same page, an orthotic is just a, 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 an insert into your shoe. So it, it props up your arch. Once your ankle has started to turn in, an arch support is just not enough. You have to control the whole foot, the whole ankle. So the next step up is the Ritchie brace or a, uh, an Arizona brace. Just, just uh, company names for a brace that goes above the ankle. And just think of it like an ankle wrap that's m made to fit your foot. Uh, and a Ritchie brace is something that you basically have to wear all the time. It goes above your ankle and it positions your ankle right. A lot of people can't tolerate it, don't want to do it. Well, there's plenty of people that are perfectly happy using that. So what do you do? To go into, you know, trying to generalize it for everybody, posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. The posterior tibial tendon is the one we're talking about. And let's assume that's what the cause of your flat foot is. Stage one of that is the tendon's just inflamed, but you don't have a flat foot. Brace, therapy, you do fine. Stage two is the unraveling, like we just talked about, where that tendon is stretched out and unraveled, and now your arch is hitting the ground. Let's fast forward three, six months, nine months, and your pain is still there. You've done everything else. You've done the, the, the bracing and everything. Well, the surgery that we usually do for it is replacing that tendon. Perhaps another myth in this whole thing, if you do have that problem, you can't repair the tendon. That tendon is a, it's a thickened, stretched out, crummy rope that's not functioning. If you, if you have a rope connected to a, you know, a horse and that rope is now stretched out and and thick and not moving, it's not working anymore. So the first thing is you, you have to get rid of it. So you take it out. But you need it. You need something to work there. So I use another tendon in your leg. So there's another tendon very close by that helps to wiggle your toes. So we'll move that tendon into place. Well, if that's all I do, what's to say you're not going to just tear my new tendon? So we actually have to realign your foot. So we go back to the comment over there. I have to break your heel bone. But I like saying osteotomize because it's not as scary. So you osteotomize your heel bone and you move it over a little bit to take the pressure off the inside of your ankle. So I'm throwing a ton at you, and that's sort of a, you know orthopedic surgery resident level three discussion, but um, individually I can talk to you about it as well. But there is definitely a surgery, and it's a good surgery, that, that helps folks out that have failed everything else with foot, flat foot stuff. The problem I have is that Excuse me, the foot is dropped on the inside, so the pain is on the outside. On the outside, that's classic. Right, what happens is, I wish I had a foot model, but essentially if, uh, I'll draw you kind of another crummy picture here. But you're, 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 the, uh, you're the textbook version of that problem. So if we're looking at you from the front, and this is your leg bone now, your tibia, your fibula is over here, your talus or your ankle bone is here, and your heel bone is down here. So this tendon we're talking about runs behind here and comes down over this way. 
So once you tear this, your heel bone is now going over that way. So as you're collapsed over, so now your heel bone, that's supposed to be straight in line, is starting to bang into your fibula bone over here. So that's why you start out with this pain over here when the tendon rips, and then it starts to develop pain on the outside after a couple of months when that heel bone, every step you take, starts banging into your ankle bone. So that's what I'm saying. Part of the surgery is bringing this heel bone back straight where it's supposed to be. And what's, um, you have time off your feet, I assume. What's, like, after a surgery like that? Yeah. Yeah, same problem. You know, anytime you osteotomize or break the heel bone, it takes six weeks for it to heal, just like anywhere. So it's, it's six weeks not walking on it. But again, if, my fix, if I put screws in there and I think it's really tight and you have good healthy bone, sometimes you can push the envelope a little bit and you start walking on it a little bit sooner. But in general, figure six months for things to heal and six months for rehab. Six weeks, I'm sorry. Six weeks for things to heal and six weeks for things to rehab. Sorry. Yeah. How do you get inflamed tendons? Inflamed tendons. So this goes, you know, neck to your toes kind of question. A rotator cuff is an inflamed tendon. An Achilles tendon is an inflamed tendon. So it's an overuse problem most of the time. And whether it's overuse from you doing a new activity or from you... Um, changing your posture or something changing that all of a sudden our tendons that are supposed to glide straight up and down are now getting rubbed like in your rotator cuff it can get rubbed under your shoulder blade and that gets it inflamed or if you take up running or Zumba or curves and you start doing activities that you weren't used to before and that Achilles tendon starts rubbing 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 it gets inflamed so it can get inflamed just like anywhere. And what can you do for that? In general the answer for any inflammation is Get rid of the inflammation, right? So taking simple things anywhere from Advil to one of the fancy ones, decreasing the activity that was causing it, and that might mean anywhere from wearing a, you know, a brace for your elbow, for your ankle. The good thing there is we can always put you in a cast or a boot or something that stops the ankle from moving, so it can stop the inflammation there. And once you've quieted down, then a lot of times you say, well, how do I stop it from ever coming back? And that's when we get into talks about orthotics or braces or things that you wear more long-term to change the mechanics about your foot so you don't get problems again. Well, I went through the boot. For your, now we were talking Achilles with you? No, no, for the inflamed tendons. Which tendons though? Is the, on the outside or the back or the inside? Mm -hmm. The inside. And That's back to that discussion back there. And I still hurt. Yeah. Well, once, and I, I can't stress enough that your first step is Never, I don't want to say never, because you know, medicine we rarely do, but very, very, very rarely is your first step surgery. But once you've done everything else, and I'm talking therapy and time and braces and pills and sometimes injections, and you've run into a wall, then you're at that, that crossroads. Do you just live with it, or do we have to talk surgery to try to fix it? And I'm not saying surgery fixes tendonitis. You have to figure out what you have, diagnose it, do the appropriate studies, whether they're x-rays or MRIs or something fancy, and then discuss how to fix it. Well, I had an MRI. That's how it um, mm -hmm. told me I had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It depends. It depends which tendon it is. Right. That's our job. Back. I have a two-part question. Uh-oh. Clinical fasciitis. Yep. Is that diagnosed basically on patient symptoms or are there physical signs as well? I, my thumb diagnoses plantar fasciitis. There's one spot on your heel where you hurt and you jump off the table when I hit that spot. So it's not at angle at all? It's no. Plantar fasciitis is your heel. Are there any conditions that would mimic the pain in the morning and then getting better in the afternoon? Yeah, I mean, depending on where your symptoms are. Um, I will say plantar fasciitis is pretty one of those classic things where it hurts me in the morning and then as I, I walk it gets better. Um, it'd be hard to say. I mean, it, it's not on the bottom of your heel that you feel it. Uh, they diagnosed me with it, but I really don't think that's what it is mm -hmm. because it's not heel pain, it's ankle yeah. pain. Well, let me, let me show you where plantar fasciitis occurs. Again, back to my cartoons. This is a, another picture that I draw all the time in the office. If that's your heel, and these are your toes, we're looking at you from the side. This plantar fascia originates right there and goes all the way out to your toes. If you look at it from below, if that's your heel and your toes are out this way now, this band of tissue kind of splays all the way out to your toes like that. And this pain occurs right there, right at that spot. 
So right on the inside of your heel, you know where the, the fat of your heel is, you go a little bit towards your toes, and that's where plantar fasciitis happens. Nowhere near your ankle. Right where? I'm oh, sorry. The, the bottom portion you're saying, correct? Yeah. The bottom. All on the bottom. Good. Yep. Yeah. Can you cover a little on the tarsal tunnel? Tarsal tunnel, sure. Um, tarsal tunnel shouldn't be confused at all with carpal tunnel, okay? Carpal tunnel, wrist, numbness to go to your fingers, super common, and probably for every hundred, maybe thousand carpal tunnels I'll see, I'll see one tarsal tunnel. Now, if you're in a foot and ankle practice exclusively, well, maybe you'll see it a little bit more. Um, but what a tarsal tunnel means, and we'll, this goes back to another nerve problem, it means the nerve that runs, it's sort of comparable to your carpal tunnel. Now, this runs right behind your ankle bone, so right on the inside here, kind of close to where the tibial tendon runs that we were talking about. That nerve somehow, for some reason, gets squeezed or compressed or inflamed or angry and starts to cause pain that radiates from the back of your ankle and shoots all the way towards your toes. Um, causes for it, most commonly the cause is biomechanical. People that have really bad flat feet and have had been flat foot for a long time are stretching the inside of their ankle and sometimes that causes it. Sometimes people will have big um, varicose veins around a nerve and those veins push on the nerve. Other people have a ganglene cyst or some kind of growth that's pushing on. Pretty rare to have it from overuse, like carpal tunnel, you know, a classic. Guys that use pile drivers or computers all the time, they'll get that. But it's not that common a problem in the ankle, but it can occur. What is the treatment? <clears throat> treatment, again, to go back, conservative stuff, shoes, arch supports, orthotics, if all that's failed, and you have real, and you got to be sure with this one. Any of these problems that aren't real common, I got to be positive that's what it is. So you might try doing a nerve test, an EMG or a nerve test, and if it shows you 100% that's what it is, and you failed the simple stuff, then a surgery. And the surgery is pretty simple. You just are releasing the scar tissue around the nerve. If there's veins around it, you get rid of the veins. If there's a cyst there, you get rid of that. So you just decompress the nerve from the back of your ankle all the way to the bottom of your foot. And the results are. I don't know, 85% probably do very, very well. As long as it, the key with all these problems and is that you want to make sure that that's what the problem was, you know? If you have a tarsal tunnel release and you come to find out that you actually have ankle arthritis, well, you're not going to get any better. So you want, as long as you, if, if you know that that's what the problem is, usually it gets. You know, the question is, I did have the shot. Uh -huh. I have tarsal tunnel. Okay. Now, does the pain go to another area of the foot, too? Can it kind of navigate? Nerve pain definitely can radiate. The toes. Yeah, compared to plantar fasciitis, which is right there on your heel and goes yeah. out there, nerve pain can go anywhere along that nerve. So sometimes the nerve pain will go towards the toes. Sometimes you feel it going up the back of your leg. Like on the top. Yeah, to the top. Yeah. It's more towards the bottom. And the big toe. Also. Bottom. I feel better this time. Okay. <laughs> I had that surgery two years ago. Tarsal tunnel surgery? Okay. Not to uh, be pessimistic, but it didn't do a damn bit good. Yeah. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> I want to ask you about microboss. Yeah. What do you think about microboss? It's a good question. It gets advertised a lot. And I have not seen a single article, a single study, or a single paragraph written in any orthopedic surgery journal about it. I've been to the Orthopedic Academy this past weekend and sat in six days worth of lectures on foot and ankle and it wasn't mentioned once. So I don't know anything about it, although you read those ads to try to make it sound like this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, I'm a little hesitant to tell you to do it. Um, I wouldn't spend my last paycheck on it, but it probably, probably doesn't cause any harm. Well, you know, in general, 25% of things are uh, placebo. So, I mean, there was a study recently about ankle arthritis, and they injected certain people with saline, and 25% of them got better. And there's no reason for it, but maybe it is. But I wouldn't spend my last paycheck on placebo stuff either. So I'd wait until there was some real science behind it. I did see you about a year ago. Uh-oh. <laughs> Achilles tendinosis. Right. Okay. And after a year, it does feel better. I'm not having the pain. Mm -hmm. I used to go into the foot. Right. But, you know, all that. 
My concern is um, I like to play tennis and mm -hmm. I do like to run and do bike and things like that. Am I going to re injure? I mean, the mm -hmm. in other words, my tendon is all messed up. Right. So tendinosis. Let me let me let me draw you that picture. I probably drew you this one on the paper in the office, right? Yeah, I'm pretty. I do a lot of drawings in the office. Right. So tendinosis is the next step past tendinitis. Okay. So itis is better than osis. So if this is your heel bone, something like this, and your ankle bone, bad like that. Your Achilles tendon comes all the way down. It's a muscle up high here. Then it becomes a tendon that inserts all the way down here into the bottom of your foot. So your bone gives a great blood supply to the tendon. The muscle gives a great blood supply to the tendon. But there's an area right in the middle that has a really, really lousy blood supply. So if you have some sort of injury, and some people know and some people don't know, you might get these little microscopic tears in this tendon. Because it has a bad blood supply, sometimes it doesn't heal normally, nice and straight. And sometimes it heals with this big ball of knotty, garbagey tissue. And you'll feel that lump in the back of your Achilles. So nice and smooth, all of a sudden a big lump, and get smooth again. And people that have that lump, and that lump hurts, that's the problem, right? That's the tendinosis problem. If you have a lump and it doesn't hurt, I don't care. But the ones that hurt are the problems. What we try is exactly, you know, you've done it. You know, you try stretching, you try ultrasound, you try a million different things. If it doesn't go away and it's still hurting you and affecting your activities, well, again, that's, we're at that crossroads. Do you live with it or do we go to the surgery route? And the surgery route essentially is removing however much, if I have to take out the whole thing, I take out the whole thing, but removing any junky tissue and then using another tendon, again, in the area, kind of like the posterior tib tendon, but another tendon to create a new Achilles. So that's, that's a bigger deal surgery. You know, that's, that's a recovery thing. To answer your question is, if you have it, I would go live your life. Play tennis, do everything you can do. It isn't as painful. I don't have the pain. Yeah. I don't, I don't even have the stiffness in the morning. You know, where it's kind of getting it. Yeah. Done. But I'm not sure what, am I, am I going to make it worse if I try to do? Well, if you make it worse, you know the end game. I mean, that's, that's orthopedics. Orthopedics is, is lifestyle surgery. We're not, you know, nobody dies of Achilles tendonitis or plantar fasciitis. The reason we, we do surgeries and operate are to get people back to their life that they lived before. And if you want to give up tennis, well, give up tennis. But if we can make you better so you don't have to give up tennis, that's when we talk about these sort of things. Um, I had double knee surgery replaced. Total knees, okay, good. Um, the one is straight, the one is not. Uh -huh. When I go to rest, uh -huh. The ankle, the, the leg turns to the side. Okay. And I'm always on the ankle. Mm -hmm. So how can I prevent any injury from mm -hmm. that? So you say when you had your knee replacements, one of them turned out perfectly straight, one still has bent to it? If I'm walking, it seems as though my legs are walking straight. Uh -huh. But if I go to rest, my legs do not perfectly straight. Mm -hmm. I'm always to the right and on the angle. So stepping on, on the outside of your foot? Right, when I'm lying mm -hmm. down. Until morning, depending on, let's say, I fell asleep on that chair. Mm -hmm. I really have a lot of pain sometimes on that uh -huh. because I've been resting on it on something hard uh -huh. for a few, few hours. Is there something? So it happened? bothers you more, yeah, I mean, it bothers you more at rest than it does when you're actually up and walking on it, you're saying, huh? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. I, it's, it's almost like there's a, I can't tell you I have a special brace or anything in mind, but uh, some kind of padding, like you're saying, to, to prevent your foot from falling out to the side. Um, I have to work on that with maybe one of our orthotic guys or podiatry guys and see if there's some kind of concept that we can use at night. There's this night splint that we use for plantar fasciitis sometimes, and maybe a brace at night that just prevents your ankle from rolling to the side would work. Something. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Ankle arthritis is not like knee arthritis, where we have a go-to 
surgery every time that works. Total knees have been around for 30, 40 years, and there are some people are promoting 25, 30 year results with total knee replacements. Ankles are a whole different animal. Your ankle joint is, you know, about that big, you know, it's not real big, and your whole body weight goes through it, and when you walk or run 10, 20, 30 times your body weight goes through it, so it's a little joint that takes a lot of force. So how to treat it simply, we treat it like any other arthritis. You can take the pills, arthritis pills, and Advil, leave ibuprofen, take your pick. Cortisone injections, it's like taking that Advil, crushing it up into a liquid, and shooting it right into the joint. That helps, and how long it helps for, who knows. It might work for a week, it might work for a year, we didn't really predict it. Then you get into you know, bracing and boots, and let's assume you've done all that, and now we're to the surgery end. Again, we're at that crossroads. So simple surgeries work for simple problems. So if you have mild arthritis and just a little bone spur and a little junk built up, well, sometimes I can go in with a camera, with like an arthroscope. People have had their knees scoped. I can scope your ankle, go in and clean out all the junk, all the spurs and all that stuff that's in there. Am I curing the arthritis? No. And arthritis means we've lost the Teflon coating at the ends of the bones. So now those bones are rubbing closer together. Fast forward past that. Now you're end stage. Your bone is against the bone and you don't know what else to do. You don't want to wear braces or anything else. Two roots. There's the fusion, which means you take those two bones, solder them together. They're fused. That's the surgery we've done for 100 years. The ankle doesn't move, so you don't have any up and down. You still have in and out and side to side, but you don't have any up and down. The pain goes away. There are some side effects. Uh, I mean, there are some risks, uh, like anything with any kind of major surgery. Um, and it's a, it's a proven good surgery. Lasts forever. Once it's fused, it's always fused. Problem is, is that those side-to-side -side movements and those up-and-down movements from the rest of your foot are taking on the rest of that force. So we think that probably 20 years after an ankle fusion, those other joints are going to start getting arthritic. So then what do you do? Well, option two is the ankle replacement, where instead of fusing the joint, we replace it with metal and plastic. And I don't think there's any orthopedic surgeon, podiatrist in the country that does those that will say they work as well as knee replacements. They just flat out don't. Knee replacements are, are a great surgery. They work wonderfully. Ankle replacements are getting better. There was one generation 20 years ago that they said this should never be done again. Lead article in the big orthopedic journal. 15 years ago, we started trying them again. I did a few of those. More complications, we backed off. Now there's a third generation of them that are out now. They've been out for five years. So best case scenario I can tell you is they work for five years. But that's the best case because they've only been out that long. So it's a, it's a good surgery for the right person, but I can't tell you it's good for 20 years. I can't tell you it's good for six years. I can tell you it's good for five so far, and 80% of them are good for five. So it's not a perfect surgery, but it's, it's an option. Yeah? I had <coughs> surgery about a year ago by you. Yeah. Um, some tendon problems where you took some stuff off the tendon and then stitched it back together. And I've noticed uh, the past few months, especially when I'm driving, uh -huh. uh, my foot will be on the on the foot rest in the car, and it kind of like locks up a little bit. But when I move it, I can feel it like kind of unlocking. Okay. Is the same place on the outside. Yeah. I mean, that's where, if I remember, it was the outside tendons. Exactly right. Right. So, they, they we're now on the opposite side, the flat foot side. These are two tendons that run behind your ankle, on the outside, and you can get tears of those. Um, Two, you know, two things that, that you think of is it's scar tissue that's kind of built up over there. And if that's the case, um, some physical therapy, some easy therapy to stretch it out and get it stronger is the easy way to go. Um, when I repair those tendons, and since I did yours, I know it, I use an absorbable suture so it's not a stitch that would still be in there. That's already gone. So probably some scar tissue that we can work out by stretching it. 